Oh, good morning, Park Avenue. The Psalm of David, number 27, says, Ah, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? That it ends with, I believe I shall see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. So wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. So stand as you're able and sing this song as we wait on the Lord to do his good work in us. For he's promised to finish what he started. In the name of Jesus, we lift up his name in this place. The Lord is my light and my salvation. The Lord is my light and my salvation. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall out the refrain now whom shall I whom shall I fear whom shall I fear oh the Lord the Lord is the strength of my time of trouble in the time of trouble i know that he shall hide oh in this time of trouble he shall hide in the time says wait on me now wait on the Lord and be of good courage oh wait on the Lord and be of good courage wait on the Lord and be of good courage he shall strengthen Shall I fear? Shall I fear? Oh, shall I fear? The Lord is the strength. The Lord is the The Lord is the strength. The Lord is the strength. The Lord is the strength. You testify the Lord is the strength, the Lord is the strength of my life. Whom shall I fear? Hallelujah. Let that be your testimony today as you're seated in the presence of the Lord. Amen. Amen. You may have your seats this morning. Well, good morning, Park. My name is Darrell. Well, hello, Park Avenue. As you have noticed, uh, our uh, pastor, our senior pastor, Greg Taylor, is not with us this morning. If you guys could do me a huge favor, though. You guys can't hear me? 
Can you hear me now? Okay, good, good, good. Like I said, or as I was saying, our senior pastor, Greg Taylor, is not with us this morning. So can you guys do me two favors? One, can you pray for him as he's being a good spouse, taking care of his wife, Amy, this morning? And number two, he's with us watching online. So can you guys just wave back at him and say, hey, Pastor Greg. Hey, Pastor Greg, we love you. Today is uh, February 26th, the last day of uh, Black History Month. I'm sorry, a few more days of Black History Month. I'm sorry, last Sunday, last Sunday of Black, listen, these black folks up here is getting me, okay? The last Sunday of Black History Month, and Martin Luther King Jr. said something about Sunday morning worship being the most segregated hour in America. But as I look around this room this morning, I see that we are setting new standards here at Park Avenue. Amen? Amen. That is uh, definitely worthy of God's praise. Amen? Well, if you are new here to Park Avenue, we just want to say welcome, welcome, welcome. If you see some new faces around you, saints, if you see some new faces, make sure that you say something to them. Um, if you also are new, we do have uh, cards that we'd like for you to fill out. Uh, do we have any ushers in the, in the room that may have a card? There we go. So there's some cards in your pews. We would love for you to fill those out so we can get back to you. And uh, Aaron is also holding up the yellow prayer card. So if you need some prayer or some intercessory prayer, uh, our minister of, uh, of uh, congregational care, Aaron Brecky, will follow up with you. Make sure that you fill out the yellow prayer card. Uh, we typically have a, a time of walking around, and when we go and walk around, we want to make sure that we introduce ourselves to someone new. Uh, so we'll put a three-minute clock on the, uh, on the timer up there. So you got about three minutes. And also, I don't know if you guys noticed, to my left, your right, the wonderful br band Brass Solidarity is in the building this morning. Thank you guys so much for showing up this morning. We love how you sound and, uh, and just in increasing our worship here at Park Avenue. All right, everybody, who's ready for walking around time? All right, there'll be a three minute timer up there and uh, Brass Solidarity will, will lead us in song as we do our walk around time. Please don't walk into the band area while we're walking around. You might get hit with a brass or something just to let you know. <laughs> All right, here we go. Thank you. 
Amen. Amen. Thank you, Black Solidarity. Thank you, Brad Solidarity. That was beautiful. Amen. All right, we are going to call one another into worship this morning. So if you wouldn't mind, the call to worship should be in your bulletin. Or, or uh, it's not in your bulletin. I, I lied. I'm sorry. It's on, it's on screen. Folks lying in church, Lord have mercy. It's on screen. So as Pastor Greg says this every week, we're going to say the call to worship like we mean it. Yes. Guide my feet while I run this race. Yes, my Lord. Hold my hand while I run this race. Yes, my Lord. Stand by me while I run this race. Yes, my Lord. I'm your child while I run this race. Yes, my Lord. Search our heart, hearts while we run this race. For we don't want to run this race in vain. Amen. Let us worship together. Good morning, Park Avenue. Oh, come on and talk back to me. Good morning, Park Avenue. Good morning. Did you come to magnify our God this morning? You came prepared to worship him. Hasn't he been good? Oh, come on, I don't hear you. Has he been good? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Truly, we are blessed and highly favored to be in the house of worship one more time. Can't take that for granted. Somebody wanted to be here and couldn't get up out that bed. But God has blessed us, given us favor to worship and magnify him on this morning. I am highly blessed because I've got one of my babies in the house. My youngest child, Miss Jasmine Steele Dickinson, is in the house. I'm going to ask that you come on down and sing with us, darling. How many of you know you've been changed? How many of you know you've been changed? That you're not what you used to be before the Lord came into your life? Hallelujah. I know I've been changed.
change you now Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Oh, God, you've been so good. We believe in you, God. The only thing that can make our lives right and can change us is the Word of God. I believe. Come on, Brother Anthony. We're going down home, everybody. Back to those old churches on those dirt roads. Y'all know anything about that? Oh, come on now. Talk back to me. Some of us ain't been city-fied all our lives. I went back to my grandfather's church when I was about 12 years old. And that old church didn't have a whole lot in it. They had this one lady. She was the only instrumentalist in the whole church. And she had a big old bass drum between her legs. And all she did was this. She just hit that drum. And we would have church for three and a half hours, magnifying God with that one little bass drum because people took the time to remember from where God had brought them. Amen? So this morning, I want you all to stay with us because this is a participatorial kind of song. Participatorial, which means you don't get a chance to be a spectator. When I say break it down, all I want you to do is just drop. Just drop. That's your way of stomping on the devil's head. I just want you to step on the devil's head this morning. So every time I say, break it down now, all I want you to do is drop. Just That's your testimony this morning. Can you do that? Yeah. I'm not asking you to work too hard. I just want you to work a little bit this morning. I said last week there's only two times to praise him, when you feel like it and when you don't. So all I want you to do is just drop when I say, break it down now, all right? Here we go, Brother Anthony. Oh, help my magic now, say it. I believe, yeah, I believe, yeah, I believe, yeah, help my magic now, say it. I believe, well, I, I believe, believe just what he said.
the name of the Lord. Is it all right if we leave it right there? I know there's another song we're supposed to sing, but the Spirit of the Lord is asking that we believe on him this morning. I believe that's the message today, that if we just believe, if we have the, the, the thoughts and, and faith of the size of the mustard seed, he will do just what he said he will. We're going to turn it over to the pulpit ministry at this time. Amen. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Javita, musicians who led us this morning. Brass Solidarity. Man, I wish we could have you here every week. <laughs> the amazing musicians who came and led us. And then our very own Marcial, of course, who we love. 
Um, well, good morning, you guys. I don't want to move out of this moment too quickly, and luckily for us, we don't have to because today is not Ash Wednesday. Today is Ash Sunday. Today is Ash Sunday. Now, on Ash Wednesday, <clears throat> we think about um, repentance, and we think about mourning, um, and we wonder how it is in the next 40 days we can journey to know God better and to know ourselves better and how we're made to bring good to this world. But like I said, today's not Ash Wednesday, it's Ash Sunday. So today we also get to hold the anticipation of Easter that's coming. I want to talk to you a little bit about what we're going to do this morning um, because we've got a few things that we've just got to explain because it is very weird to be doing an Ash Wednesday on Sunday morning, isn't it? Um, I'm not sure if you guys heard, but we got some snow this week. <clears throat> just a bit. So we canceled our Ash Wednesday service. And um, along, along with people all around our city and in other cities, too. And so this morning, we're going to be doing Ash, Ash Sunday. And what's kind of unique about this year, I think, is that we're going to be doing this with people all around the U.S. who canceled their services this Wednesday. So as we, we do Ashes this morning, we can think of those in cities around the U.S. and world who are taking on Ash Sunday, a very unusual day this morning. Let me explain how it's going to work, and then I'm going to talk to you a little bit. If you're sitting in the pews right now and you're like, what even is Ash Wednesday? Do not worry. I'm going to tell you. <laughs> and it's okay that you don't know. Um, we, um, in just a moment, what's going to happen is um, <clears throat> I'm going to invite Erin Brecky forward. She's going to pray for us. And at the end of that time, you are invited to come forward to receive ashes. There'll be stations on either side here and one in the back. And if you are unable to get up but you'd like to receive ashes, Erin will be, she's going to wave right now in the sweater. Um, she'll be wandering and walking around and just give her a little signal and she'll come give you ashes right in your seat, okay? Um, and Darrell will be in the back if you're in overflow today and you'd like to see her. And if you're at home, I'm looking for the camera, if you're at home today, you can participate with us too. So I'm going to invite you right now to just grab something in your home if you'd like to participate. Uh, maybe some olive oil, maybe some kind of oil that you use for makeup, for skincare. Um, you're also welcome to just grab whatever you have that'll use. Our uh, awesome Ann Bauer said this morning, just swipe your finger over the coffee table that you never dust. <laughs> You'll have a little something on your finger you can use. <laughs> so I'm going to invite you to go ahead and if you'd like to participate to get up and grab something now for you. Uh, for those of you here, the ushers are not going to dismiss you because this is an invitation, not an expectation. If you would like to participate, whenever you're ready, after Aaron has prayed, we just want to in invite you to come forward or behind you and receive ashes. And if you don't, that's okay too. You can use the time to just sit in your seat. You could pray. You could just choose to be quiet and listen. Um, that is up to you. So there will be no ushers dismissing you. Whenever you're ready, you just come forward or come backwards, depending on where you're sitting. Um, so, what is Ash Wednesday? Well, Ash Wednesday marks the beginning of Lent, which is a 40-day journey to Easter. Now, if you counted up the days, they'd be more than 40. And that is because we do not include Sundays in the journey of Lent. Those Sundays are what we call a mini Easter, which means in the midst of preparing for what's to come, we remind ourselves on Sunday morning <laughs> that Easter is coming. We take a break from our um, whatever it is that you have taken on for Lent. There are lots of different ways to celebrate as you think about growing your relationship with God. People do all sorts of different things. Um, if you're on our email list, we actually sent a few things that you could do to your home this week. Um, and so you may have chosen to engage with one of those, or you might have something that you do on your own for Lent. Either one of those, any of those is great as you prepare. But on Easter, we take a minute and we say, or I'm sorry, on Sundays, we take a minute and we say, hey, we are thinking about this stuff over here during Lent, but on Sunday, we're going to remember Easter is on its way. And we have a mini celebration. And so here we are on a very strange Ash Sunday. This is unique, right? A time where in one hand, we hold the mourning, the lament, the repentance, all of that. And in this hand over here, we hold the anticipation of Easter. This morning, we're going to hold both. We're going to hold both. Um, Rachel had held Evans, who you guys know I love. 
um, said it really well here. If you'll just bear with me, I'm going to read a quote from her book, Searching for Sunday, that talks about Ash Wednesday. Once a year, on a Wednesday, we mix the ashes with oil. We light candles, and we confess to one another and to God that we have sinned by what we have done and what we have left undone. We tell the truth, and then we smear the ashes on our foreheads and together acknowledge the single reality upon which everyone, Catholic and Protestant, believer, atheist, scientist, mystic, can agree. Remember that you are dust, and to dust you will return. This is the only thing that we know for sure. We will die. But a long time ago, a promise was made. A prophet called Isaiah said a messenger would come to proclaim good news to the poor and brokenhearted, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. Those who once repented in dust and ashes will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of the Lord's splendor, Isaiah 61.3. We could not become like God, so God became like us. God showed us how to heal instead of kill, how to mend instead of destroy, how to love instead of hate, how to live instead of long for more. And when we nailed God to a tree, God forgave. And when we buried God in the ground, God got up. And so, friends, Today we remember that we are dust, and we will return to dust. But in this other hand, we remember that Easter is coming. I'm going to invite Erin to come pray for us now, and in just a moment she's going to invite you forward, if you choose, anyone who wants to, young or old, to receive ashes. All right, good morning. Let's take a minute and just kind of prepare our hearts for this. We had so much fun celebrating this morning. It's, it can be kind of a tricky transition, right? So let's just take a moment. Let's root ourselves in this space, okay? I know my brain is feeling really scattered and just disjointed today. Let's just take a moment. Root yourself in this space. Feel your seat beneath you, behind you, holding you up, supporting you. Maybe put your feet fat, flat on the floor. Ground yourself in the room. Realize that the same floor that's supporting you is supporting all of us. Take a deep breath. Remind yourself that in scripture, God's spirit is likened to breath. Take another breath, maybe longer this time. Remind yourself that just as the spirit of God, that the spirit of God is closer to us than even the breath within our lungs. One more breath. Remind yourself that just as we cannot live without breath, we cannot live without the Spirit of God. As we enter into the season of Lent, we're invited into a time of self-reflection. Self-reflection before God. Where is God at work in us? Where is God at work in me? Where is God at work in the world? Am I open to this work? God beckons us. God pursues us. But God does not force God's self upon us. God waits for our consent and our invitation. So if, and when you're ready, maybe offer a prayer of invitation before God, an invitation to God, 
that God might bring you insight into a place where you might be resisting God? How is God asking you to join in God's work to heal this broken world? Invite God to show you where God's beckoning you further in and further up into God's love. invite the ministers to come forward receive ashes
Let's close this portion of our time with a prayer written by Jan Richardson. And then I'll move us just right into our time of intercessory prayer after that. Let's pray. All those days, you felt like dust, like dirt. As if all you had to do was turn your face toward the wind and be scattered to the four corners or swept away by the smallest breath as insubstantial. Did you not know what the Holy One can do with dust? This is the day we freely say we are scorched. This is the hour we are marked by what has made it through the burning. This is the moment we ask for the blessing that lives within the ancient ashes, that makes its home inside the soil of this sacred earth. So let us be marked, not for sorrow, and let us be marked, not for shame. Let us be marked not for false humility or for thinking we are less than we are, but for claiming what God can do within the dust, within the dirt, within the stuff of which the world is made, and the stars that blaze in our bones and the galaxies that spiral inside the smudge that we bear. Now I'm going to invite us into a time of intercessory prayer where we can bring before God all that weighs our hearts down and the needs of the world. You are welcome to come to the altar to pray or just in the quiet of your own spirit where you're sitting right now at home or if you're gathered with us this morning. Let's lift up the needs, some of the needs uh, that people within our own body have shared Let's help hold each other's burdens. And let us also respond to God's invitation to partner with God's work to heal all the brokenness of this world. Lord, thank you for this weird ash Sunday. Because life is weird, it's celebrations and trumpets and claiming beliefs and it's acknowledging that we are dusty, messy, broken, scorched, all at the same time. Help us to live into that, into the truth of all of that. Lord, we do want to lift up the prayers of the people within this congregation. I know everybody comes into this space with a prayer on their heart. So I add these prayers today to those prayers that are already being lifted up. Lord, for those living with illness, whether chronic or acute, whether physical or mental, May they experience deep and full healing, skilled care, and courage. And may we be a people where your mercy is made manifest. For those who live with grief, whether over the recent loss of a loved one or a grief that still lingers long after the loss, May they know the abiding love of Jesus who will someday wipe away every tear. And may we be a people who can sit in the ache with one another. For those with unnamed griefs, pregnancy loss, infertility, loneliness or isolation, estrangement from loved ones, family strain, painful marriages, 
parenting struggles, may they know that you see them and that which breaks their hearts. And may we be a people who can see each other through the honest mess of life. For those fighting to stay sober, those in recovery from addiction to substances, overwork, perfection, or approval, may they have victory in the power of the Spirit. And may we be a people who can hold each other up. For those who are rebuilding and writing a new chapter of their stories, may you be honored by their bravery and may they be strengthened for the journey. And may we be a people who can cheer each other on. For those who are unemployed or underemployed or financially struggling, the unhoused, unsheltered, and unfed, may you provide for every need. And may we be a people who share. For those who need wisdom and direction, may you providentially guide them and lead them. And may we be a people who can help hold up a flashlight for the, plat for the path ahead. And for those who have been hurt by the church through neglect or rejection, may you heal them and show them who you really are. And may we be a people of repentance Show us how to do better. And now I invite you to join me in the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. All right, kids and youth, you're free to go have fun. <laughs> Thanks for joining us this morning. Um, we hope, you know, church is a different kind of fun. But you're welcome to go off with Darrell. Or Annie. If you're up to sixth grade, go that way. If you're middle school and high school, go that way. Well, as the uh, youth and children are dismissing, let us get ready for offering time. You know, one of the things that I wanted to just uh, share with you was the, this, the story, the inspiration around my giving. And um, so some of you know that I grew up in South Minneapolis, not too far from here. And as a young person, um, there was always wonderful things happening at Park Avenue for the children and youth of, of the neighborhood. And when I came to Park Avenue, some 20 plus years ago. Oh, 30? Okay, 30. <laughs> I got this echo in the back here, right? <laughs> um, it was really because we wanted our children to have that same wonderful experience, and they did. And as I matured and grew in the church, I, you know, try to direct my giving to support the youth and children. And one of my favorite ways of supporting it uh, was, was through uh, Vacation Bible School. Yes. <laughs> and I, I noticed that Vacation Bible School is uh, in the bulletin today. So if you, like me, support Vacation Bible School, you have the opportunity to give. And the reason why I love Vacation Bible School is uh, I actually grew up in St. Paul. And um, there was a church that was on my corner. It wasn't my faith church, but it was really close in the neighborhood. It's called, um, I think it was Bethlehem Lutheran Church, right on the corner of Dale and, and Carroll. And um, 
I live next door to my cousin, and so in the summertime, we would always go up to the church on the corner and do vacation Bible school, and we had so much fun together. We made crafts, we had all kinds of good snacks, we got in trouble afterwards, you know. It just was a wonderful experience. So that's my motivation. Whatever yours is, uh, this is a time for you to reflect on that and, uh, and consider giving. I'm not sure if the, um, uh, the uh, passage in the Bible is uh, behind me on the screen, but it should be 2 Corinthians uh, verse 9-11, and it reads as follows. You will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion, and through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. I would invite the ushers if they would please come forward, and please know that in addition to uh, putting something in the offering plate, you have the opportunity to text to give at 84321. And um, I think we learned maybe about six weeks ago that we can also give through Venmo. So whatever is uh, convenient uh, to you, please do so. And if you want to get involved in um, just automatic uh, offering, um, please um, look in the bulletin and you'll find out the individual who you should speak to uh, to make that happen. Thank you so much for your generosity. Brother Anthony, would you come on and sing this one for me? I don't feel no ways tied. to you know my testimony this morning is whatever God asks you to do go ahead and do it Amen. I woke up this morning with the most excruciating back pain I've ever had in my life but I wasn't going to let nothing hold me back Amen. I wanted to come and lift up the name of the Lord so here I am the song we're going to sing is I Don't Feel No Ways Tired by Reverend James Cleveland. started started from yeah. and nobody told me that the road would be easy I don't believe he brought me this far to leave me yeah, sing it again. Hey, I don't Fear no waste time. I've come too far from where I started, where I started from. But nobody told me that this road would be easy. I don't believe he brought me this far. Just to leave me here. Mm -hmm. I don't. I don't. Feel no waste time. I don't believe it. Come too far. No, no. Where, where I started. started from. Nobody. 
Nobody told me. Nobody told me. The road, the road, the road would, would be, be there. there. I don't believe. I don't believe it. I don't believe. I know. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for these gifts uh, that have been generously given so that we can do your work on this earth. Also, thank you, dear Heavenly Father, for the gifts of time uh, that uh, people have also generously pledged so that we can world, make the world a better place. These things we ask in Jesus' holy name. Amen. morning, brothers and sisters. May I greet you in the words of the Apostle Paul. Grace and peace to you from God, our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. I am confident of this, that the one who began a good work among you will bring it to completion by the day of Jesus Christ. I love that greeting. It reminds me that we are all works in progress, or at least I'll speak for myself. Christians under construction. Turn to your neighbor, look him or her in the eye, and tell him there's a good work started in me. Turn to somebody else and say, be patient. God isn't through with me yet. Some of y'all look like you wanted to act for a little extra patience. <laughs> I'm uh, delighted to be with you uh, this morning, although uh, I will tell you that it wasn't planned at the beginning of the week that I would be in the pulpit. I got a call from Reverend Taylor uh, midweek, I think it was Wednesday or it might have been Thursday, uh, asking me if I would uh, step in to the gap. Um, uh, he, I, and I pray that I am not uh, sh oversharing here, but uh, his wife, uh, Amy, uh, had a fall on the ice. 
um, and um, caused some damage. And uh, she is at home uh, preparing for, I believe there's going to be some kind of procedure sometime this week. So if you would, um, and I hope that uh, uh, Reverend Taylor and Amy are watching, but uh, can we take a moment just to lift them up in prayer? Now let's be in an attitude of prayer. Gracious God, we know that you are the healer. You are Jehovah Rapha, which is your covenant name. Your name, Rapha, is healer. And you said that name as a covenant, as an unbreakable promise. And so we come standing on your word that you are who you say you are. We prayed and sang this morning that we believe what you say you will do. And so we believe in healing now for Amy. Lord, we believe that she is in your hands. You know, the scripture, we are reminded that the scripture says that all things work together for the good, for those who love you and are called according to your purpose. It doesn't say just the good things or the things that we like, but that all things. And so we are claiming in the name of Jesus that even this thing will work together for the good. And so, Lord, in Jesus' name, we lift up Amy to you that you would heal her, your word says that by your stripes we are healed, that she is healed, and we stand on it, we believe it, and we claim it in the name of Jesus. And all who agree before the Lord say together, amen, amen. and amen. I want to express gratitude to those who um, helped produce this worship service today, and there are many, the ushers and uh, greeters, the sound, the PowerPoint, and video technicians, um, the praise team, uh, that choir, that choir, that choir, there's one, I don't know what got into y'all, but we need to get some more of it into y'all. I, I actually saw Marshall standing up at the piano. You know worship is on when Marshall is standing up uh, at the piano. Um, all of the musicians, a wonderful choir director, uh, and all of the staff and volunteers who read, announced, prayed, and served from the pulpit and from the altar, can we acknowledge your service with a hand praise? Amen. And then I would take a moment, a point of personal privilege to uh, acknowledge and to greet uh, some personal friends of mine uh, Jeff and Rochelle Hassan and their grandson Malik, uh, who like to just tip in quietly and go unnoticed and hate it when they are called out from the pulpit, but I'm going to do it anyway. I'm not going to point to them. They're right over there in the middle. <laughs> but <laughs> it, it blesses my heart uh, to see you all here worshiping with us this morning. Today, uh, as has been uh, acknowledged elsewhere in the service, is the first Sunday of Lent, which as you know is the 40-day season leading up to the resurrection of Christ on Easter Sunday. It is a time of deep penitence and sacrifice for Christians, but also a time of uh, joyful hope. Today also, as uh, Darrell mentioned, is the final Sunday and among the last few remaining days of Black History Month which is a time when we give special attention to the contributions of African Americans to this country and to the world. But if there was a through line between Lent and Black History Month, it would be the celebration of present hope born of past sacrifice. Present hope born of past sacrifice. Both Lent and Black History Month live in a kind of tension between the certainty of past injustice and the hope of future restoration and reconciliation. Harlem Renaissance poet uh, James Weldon Johnson captured this tension in his poem, Lift Every Voice and Sing, which was set to music by his brother, J. Rosamund Johnson, and became known as the Black National Anthem. The song includes these verses. Sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun of our new day begun. 
let us march on till victory is won. Our scripture today also presents a message of sacred sacrifice and, and holy hope. Turn with me, if you will, to the New Testament Gospel of Matthew, chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. Again, Matthew 4, verses 1 through 11. If you are watching on YouTube, um, now's the time you can put it on pause and run and get your Bible. Uh, if your Bible isn't at your hand or check it out on your Bible app. Um, if you're in the sanctuary, uh, we are apparently are having some, some um, problems with the, uh, with the screen. And so uh, your options are to check out the Bibles in front of you in your pews. Um, or perhaps behind you, or to look at your uh, Bible app or the Bible that you brought with you. Um, I will be reading from the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible. When you have found the scripture, say word. If you need a little more time, say wait for me. Okay, we're going to wait. Dun, 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 dun. Word, all right. <laughs> All right. Hear the word of the Lord. <clears throat> then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, it is written, one does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him again, it is written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in all their splendor. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and suddenly angels came and waited on him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. In the few minutes I have to share with you this morning, I want to speak to you from the topic, don't trifle with temptation. <clears throat> don't trifle with temptation. Pray with me, please. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows flow, whatever my lot thou hast told, Satan would buffet, though trials would come. Let this blessed assurance control. 
that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and has shed his own blood for my soul. Join me. It is well, it is well with my soul, with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. Almighty God. Who calms and comforts my soul. The moment of preaching has come. By the power of your spirit, anoint your servant at this time that I may preach the word you have placed on my heart with boldness, humility, clarity and insight, passion and power, fervor and flow. Remove from me everything that displeases you and from this sanctuary. Remove every hindrance to your presence that I may speak and your people may hear. A life-giving, uplifting, way-making word. This is my prayer and all who agree before the Lord say together amen, amen. and amen. Don't trifle with temptation. In this situational text from Matthew's Gospel, Jesus is just beginning his earthly ministry. Right before his encounter with the devil, which was described in the passage we just read, Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist. The Gospel says the Spirit of God in the form of a dove descended upon Jesus as he emerged from the River Jordan. Matthew goes on to report that a voice from heaven said, This is my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. And then right after that, right after that, right after that sacred moment of anointing, of commissioning, right after that, the Spirit led Jesus to the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Jesus fasted for 40 days and 40 nights before Satan began to test him. But before we explore this divine encounter with the devil, I want to highlight a couple of small but significant gems that might get lost if we move on too quickly. The first is that God did not abandon Jesus when he was about to be tested by Satan. Indeed, the text says the Spirit, God's Spirit, led him to the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. I'm going to let that sit with you for just a moment. It says the Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Now, before you go off on a false theological pursuit, be careful not to read into the text an insinuation that God arranged or endorse the testing of Jesus. Rather, we should understand that the Spirit of God guided and accompanied Jesus to his appointment with temptation. Is this making sense to anybody? The Bible says, when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does God, attempt, nor does God tempt anyone. The takeaway here is that temptation is a constant, no matter who you are. It's what the devil does. And if the devil tests Jesus, you better believe, or we used to say, you best believe that God will, excuse me, the devil will test you. Somebody ought to say amen. The second point I don't want us to miss is that baptism is not a bulwark against temptation. God's favor won't protect you from temptation. And saying yes to a mission won't insulate you from Satan's attention. Indeed, the opposite is true. 
When you sign up to serve the Lord, you are waving a red flag in front of the enemy, making yourself a high-value target. Y'all don't hear me this morning. So be on the alert. Forewarned is forearmed. And that brings us to the main part of our text. After Jesus had fasted for 40 days and nights, the devil tried to tempt him. And listen, listen. He first went after his body, challenging Jesus to make food for himself out of stones. Then he began to try to test his mind, daring Jesus to jump off the top of the temple based on some distorted theology of death. And finally, the devil targeted Jesus' spirit, offering Jesus a bribe if he would switch allegiance to state. He went after his mind, body, and spirit. But in each instance, Christ refused to be tempted. Satan is opportunistic, relentless, and employs a variety of tactics to draw us into wickedness. Consider this. The devil came to Jesus when he was famished. This was an opportunistic attack. You ever notice how vulnerable and impressionable you are when you're hungry? Maybe, maybe, maybe that's just me. I try not to go to the grocery store when I'm hungry. And, and I'm going to tell you why. Because I have a habit of buying anything and everything in sight. And then I get home and after I've eaten, I ask myself, you know, why did I buy that jar of pickled pig's feet? I don't eat meat pork. (laughs) Back in the day when I did eat pork, pig's feet wasn't even on the menu. But when I'm hungry, I'm vulnerable and impressionable. And I'm subject to suggestion. Let's put it that way. That's why Satan showed up at the end of Christ's fast. He wanted to tempt Jesus when he was hungry and presumably weak and vulnerable. But the devil didn't understand that while Christ was physically famished, he was spiritually satisfied. I can't get no help this morning. (laughs) Fasting may leave the body weak, but the spirit grows strong. Amen, somebody. Temptation is opportunistic, but also relentless. Satan came at Jesus three times in three locations, used three tactics, and three weapons. <laughs> we don't have time this morning to unpack the entire assault, but let me point out just a couple of ways temptation can come at you and me from multiple fronts. Notice that Satan tested Jesus in the wilderness, in the city, and finally on a mountaintop. I tell you, there is no hiding from temptation. There is no safe space from Satan. Have you ever been tempted when you were alone? Oh, come on, I'm not the only one. (laughs) Tempted when you are alone? Temptation preys on loneliness and thrives in desert places. When you're isolated or away from home or separated from the people and the persons who you know who keep you accountable. Don't get quiet on me now, Park Avenue. Temptation also abounds in urban and suburban places. Wherever people congregate in large numbers, cities in particular offer a living smorgasbord of sinful opportunity. Somebody knows what I'm talking about. And then there are the mountaintops, the exalted places and experiences that provide yet another venue for temptation. Every day, it seems, we learn about another business leader, politician, celebrity, or sports hero who has been knocked off their pedestal because they succumb to what? To temptation. Our scripture also illustrates the varied tactics that Satan will employ to recruit us to his wicked cause. First, he tried to taunt Jesus, saying, if you are the son of God. Now, make no mistake, don't, get, don't trip on this. Satan knew exactly who he was. But this was a taunt. He was like, if you're supposed to be who you say you are, if You are so bad. So he first tried to taunt him. If you are the son of God, command these stones. Then he had 
the nerve, the, the unmitigated temerity to try to use scripture on Jesus to trip him up. Use this twisted idea that if you throw yourself off here, here, basically I'm telling you, commit suicide, but pay no attention to the ground at the bottom here because the scripture says the Lord will take care of you. Try to trip him up. Try to trip him up using a, a false narrative of scripture with mocking concern. And then when taunting in scripture had failed, Satan resorted to what? To a straight up bride promising Jesus all the kingdoms of the world if he would just take a knee and worship him. But Jesus passed each test. Let me say it again. Jesus passed each test. You might say he was tested, but not tempted. He passed each test. But here's the question for us today, beloved. What chance do you and I have against temptation? And what can we learn from Jesus about how to handle a direct onslaught from the devil? Let me make three brief recommendations, and then I'm going to take my seat. First, take precautions. Second, make preparations. And finally, don't trifle with temptation. Take precautions. We don't always know when temptation is coming. But sometimes we do, as in today's text. Matthew says Jesus was led into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. So Jesus knew he was going to be tempted. And armed with that knowledge, Jesus took precautions. He fasted and prayed. He took measures in advance to avert the coming evil and secure a good result. He took precautions. I don't know about you, but that makes sense to me. If you knew in advance that a certain car would come barreling down the road intent on running you down, Jaleel, I think you'd do the wise thing and step behind a concrete barrier, or better yet, Get out the way. Get off the road. Take precautions. When you know you're going to be ambushed by temptation, prepare yourself. Get out of the way. Stay off the streets. Of course, sometimes temptation doesn't come looking for us. We put ourselves in the presence or path of temptation. Help me, Lord. Oh, I, I see y'all got quiet over there on that one. Maybe I need to say that again. Sometimes temptation doesn't go looking for us. We go looking for temptation. We know our weaknesses. We know what we're doing is wrong, but we go after it or let it come after us, knowing we are powerless to resist. Sometimes we can be our own worst enemy when it comes to fighting temptation. And here's the truth, beloved. Listen, listen. Many people, even church folks, even Park Avenue church folks, have a high tolerance for temptation. Hang on to old habits, old relationships, old behaviors, and place ourselves in situations we know will tempt us to sin. Maybe they're thinking, I know this temptation and I can handle it. <laughs> well, if that's what you're thinking, you're wrong. Let me just say, wake up! Wake up! Temptation is not benign. It is aggressive and will attack. The Bible says the devil is like a lion, seeing whom he will devour. You can be minding your own business and temptation will come looking for you without invitation or warning, just as it went looking for Jesus. Wake up! There's some types of evil so powerful that they can only be removed or resisted by fasting. I recall a demon-possessed boy recorded in the 17th chapter of Matthew. Disciples, despite their long and many efforts, were unable to exercise the demon. And they came back to Jesus lamenting 
their inability, their, 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 their fecklessness in trying to remove that devil from the boy. But Jesus told them, one, they lacked faith or adequate faith. And two, he said, some evil spirits can only be driven out by what? Prayer and fasting. Fasting and prayer, reading your Bible, stepping out of the way are all valid precautions for dealing with temptation, especially when you know temptation is nearer on the way. Let's move on to the next point, which is to make preparations. Let me let you in on uh, what is not a secret. We are at war with Satan, and we need to be prepared. Ephesians 6 tells us our struggles are not against enemies of flesh and blood, but against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. Satan used in this text today multiple weapons and tactics in his efforts to tempt Christ. But Christ defeated each of those multiple efforts and tactics with a single with a single device, and that was the Word of God. When temptation attacks, sisters and brothers, Scripture should be already in you, because if you have to Google the Word of God, you might be too late. When you are tempted with fear, you need to be able to call up Psalm 27, the Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the enemy threatens your health, you need to be able to recite Isaiah 5, 53 and 5. By his stripes, I am healed. When the trickster tries to take credit for your blessings, you need to know the word that says every good and perfect gift comes from above. And when calamity comes, you need to have a personal testimony of Psalm 91. A thousand may fall at my side, 10,000 at my right hand, but it will not come near me. You need the word in you. Photographic memory is not required. And you don't have to recite scripture in perfect order. You just need to know the essence of the word and be able to call it forth with conviction born of faith. The spirit of scripture is enough to whip the devil and send him packing. I tell you, there is power in the word. Power to arrest temptation and put the devil on the run. The same weapon that Jesus used to run off the devil is available to you and me. Let me say that again. The same weapon that Jesus used to run the devil off is available to you and me. But you have to know it to show it. Choose it to use it. Read it to plead it. You can't speak it if you don't seek it. Is this making sense to anybody? It makes good sense to me. Study your Bible. It's not just for Sunday school anymore. There is power and protection in the word of God so make preparations. All right, let's wrap this up. Take precautions, make preparations, and uh, our final point, don't trifle with temptation. Let me make this plain. Don't dither, dawdle, dilly-dally. Don't linger, loiter, loaf, lurk, waste time, or hang out with the tempter. Is this being clear enough? Contradict, but don't converse. State your case, but don't commiserate. Make a point and move on. Finish the test and step. Satan is not your friend. He ain't your homie. He is the enemy. Don't trifle with temptation. Consider how Christ responded to the devil's testing. He didn't engage in small talk or extended conversation didn't socialize, didn't do or say anything to invite additional time in the presence of evil. Satan propositioned, Jesus rebuked, using just enough words to be crystal clear and rock solid firm. No more, 
no less, no bargaining, no negotiation, and no counteroffers. And we should do likewise. The Bible tells us to flee from temptation. Y'all don't get that. Let me demonstrate. Let me give you a visual aid. Flee. Take that hat and turn it back in. Flee. Hit it. Stop. Flee from temptation. Wish I had a witness in this church this morning. We spend too much time, we spend too much time flirting with temptation, trying to bargain or manage the impulse to sin. We even convince ourselves that small doses of sin are non-lethal and are not really evil at all. I'm only telling a little lie. I'm skimming only off the top. It's a victimless crime. Stealing from the wealthy, is, it's justified. They have so much. What they don't know won't hurt them. And then everybody's favorite, what happens in Vegas? It comes back to Minneapolis, I'm here to tell you. This is a trick of the devil to take advantage of our weakness and convince us to turn away from God, but the devil is a liar and the truth ain't in him. The Bible says, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Don't trip, beloved. Don't fall for the enemy's tricks. You can walk away from temptation without giving in. To, without giving in. You can walk away from temptation without giving in. You can walk away from temptation without giving in. Jesus has paved and illuminated the path. You can reject temptation without bargaining with it. Jesus has shown us how. Here's the good news, and I'm going to end with this. First, know that your trial is evidence that you are called and anointed to serve the Lord. Oh, that bears repeating there. Know that your trial, your test, is evidence that you are called hmm, that you are called and anointed to serve the Lord. Any genuine work of God always will attract the unwholesome attention of Satan. Second, here's more good news. You are not alone in your trial. The Holy Spirit which led and attended to Jesus in the wilderness will guide and accompany you through every encounter with the devil. I'm not telling you what I heard from somebody else. I'm telling you what I can testify to myself. The songwriter said it better than I and said, I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry, and from the waters lifted me now safe, <laughs> safe. Say, am I? If you've never been caught up in Satan's snare and had to call on the name of Jesus, you better ask somebody. Oh, I wish the saint would call, holler out with me this morning. There is power in the name, deliverance in the name, healing in the name, victory in the name, peace in the name of Jesus. I've seen it with my own eyes. Temptation has retreated at the name of Jesus when I called it out. And I've witnessed temptation arrested and bound and shackled by calling out the word of God. It's in the book. It's in the book. You can believe it. It's in the book. You don't have to walk this path alone, beloved. The Holy Spirit, which is also known as the Helper, will be your companion and guide. So repeat these words after me. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Take precautions. Make preparations in whatever you do. Don't trifle with temptation. Amen? Amen. Amen.
Yeah, Sister Dot, would you come and sing this for us? Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Pastor Belton, after we minister this song, would you be kind enough? We're uh, losing Marcel for about three weeks. He'll be gone for two, two Sundays for sure. He's heading back to France to visit his family. And we want to pray over him and ask God to give him travel mercies. Amen? Amen? We take him for granted many times, but we love you. And we want to see God bless you and your family as you visit. Hallelujah. Come back refreshed and ready to worship on, on fire for the Lord. Amen.
Someday we will overcome. That is not the we shall overcome I grew up with, but I ain't mad at you. I ain't mad at you. Um, I, it's my pleasure to uh, bring this. Well, I take that back. It's, it's not my pleasure, but it is my responsibility to bring this worship service to a close. We have had church, as we used to say this morning. And I am grateful for all of those who participated and for you, for the spirit of the living God, which has been in this place. Before we uh, dismiss, I want to do two things. I do want to pray uh, for Masyal, but uh, I would also draw your attention to the many important announcements. Particularly, there are some pertaining to children, as my wife uh, has already stolen my thunder and read the bulletin before me. Uh, but we'll draw those to your attention. Uh, also looking for volunteers for Cornerstone, uh, which is an important, it's a really an important ministry uh, to this church. Um, the Easter Garden is back. And so you know that on Easter Sunday, we fill up the sanctuary with flowers. I believe they're usually lilies. Is that right? Easter lilies? I don't think we do Easter petunias. We do Easter lilies, and we fill them up, and you can make a donation here, and which will help support that effort as well so be sure to read uh, the bulletin and take that with you um, so that you can catch them on those announcements and now would you extend your hands if you will to Marshall um, as we lift him in prayer Lord you are God of creation and you are everywhere and so we know that you have already prepared a place and prepared protection over Marcial as he travels home to Paris and to France to be with his family, Lord. We pray that this will be a time of rejuvenation and that you will tend to his body, mind, and spirit while he is away, Lord. We pray, Lord, that you will give him travel mercy and that all those who travel will receive the same mercy uh, as Marcial because of your grace. And so now, Lord, return him to us safely um, that we would, he would rejoin and that he would rejoin us with a renewed vigor and commitment and passion uh, for the gospel. We ask all of this in the name of our risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And now, <clears throat> hear these words of blessing. And as Pastor Greg likes to say, let me see your eyes. You don't have to close your eyes or look down, but let me see your eyes. Some of y'all are giving me googly eyes, and so you stop that right now. Just plain old eyes would be <laughs> sufficient. <laughs> May the light of God surround you. The love of God enfold you. The power of God protect you. And the presence of God watch over you. Wherever you are, know that God is and all is well. And as we say together every week, at Park Avenue, I can do, I can do all, things all things through Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ who strengthens me. Strengthens me. We, can we can do all things, all things through Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ who strengthens us. Go and serve the Lord.